it's got the most average Jesus follower story of anybody, right? Like if there's ever been a, a, a story of like how you flow into just God's hand, it's my story, right? It's really about the tale of, of two, two kind of periods of time with faith. Uh, I grew up in a home, we, we lived in eight states growing up. So I used to tell everybody when I'd go to a new school that my dad was a hit man uh, and it was time to move. But my dad was just climbing the corporate ladder. So we literally did this lap around the country. It was like uh, Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, Connecticut, New Jersey, Georgia, California, Illinois. And then when I was 16 years old, we moved back to Georgia. And so it was just like this crazy lap. And you know, the home I grew up in was, was, was a great home. Uh, my parents, you know, didn't teach me to be an axe murderer. They taught me not to steal my neighbor's lunch. But it really wasn't like this Jesus follower home. It really wasn't, you know, we were Christers, as Andy Stanley calls us. You know, Christmas and Easter, we'd show up at church. Um, but there was this, this kind of family train wreck that happened in our family. And my mom uh, took the initiative to go into a church and kind of start to feel and invite the rest of us, my dad and, and my sister and I. And we showed up. And so that was my, my kind of first taste of faith, right? It just, it felt good to walk into a church and to know that there was something more important than me that was out there. There was a purpose bigger than what I was trying to stare at. And so grew up in that home and, and uh, it, it was great. It, it felt really, really good. But um, I got a scholarship to Georgia Tech. Keep, I see somebody wearing a, they, they positioned you here it, purposely, right? And somebody's wearing a Garcia Parra shirt over there. You probably didn't know my story, but. Um, so I ended up at Georgia Tech. Now I'm gonna tell you how I got there. Uh, I was, uh, my, my connection when I was growing up to meet new friends, because just imagine every two years you show up at a new school and you got to meet new friends. And I was like, I mean, it just sucks, right? I mean, it's brutal. You walk in, you're the new kid. But my deal was if they could just watch me throw something, they knew that I could throw harder than everybody else at the school. So I was, that was just my thing was sports. So I show up in, in Alfred, I went to Chattahoochee High School. And uh, all of a sudden I show up, I try out for the football team and baseball team. and. Um, I go to play at the Alfreda Legion 201, right there in Alfreda. And some my coach comes down and says, hey, you're not scheduled to pitch tonight, but Georgia Tech's here to watch some kid on the other team. Do you want to pitch? And I was like, give me the ball. <laughs> Absolutely, I know how this is gonna go. <laughs> Nine inning no hitter with 17 strikeouts. <laughs> so that was great, but the problem was Georgia Tech tried to find that pitcher the next three or four years I was at Georgia Tech. Or they're like, God, the guy we watched strike out all those guys never showed up. Got to play in the College World Series my freshman year with Nomar, Jason Veritek, a handful of other guys. Incredible experience. I learned a lot. I learned they were much better than me. Um, and then my junior year, out of nowhere, uh, I get drafted by the Florida Marlins. Now, it sounds like a great story, and I could, act, I could just leave it there and say I got drafted. But the reality was I was drafted in the 69th round. They don't even have 69 rounds anymore, right? Like, they stopped at like 25. But it was a great opportunity. But what, what had happened, kind of going back to the faith story, what had happened was I left my parents' house and I left with their faith, not my own faith. Now the grounding, the grounding force for me was that I'd met my wife in high school at Chattahoochee and she was way smarter than me and went to Georgia Tech, not because of baseball, but because of grades. And uh, you know, she, she kept me grounded, but I had my parents' faith, not my own faith. And so we got married right after I got drafted and we spent six years playing minor league baseball and it was awesome, right? Like, I, I tell everybody, I got to do everything you could possibly do in professional baseball. It was awesome. I struck out guys in the Hall of Fame. I gave up a few home runs to guys that are you know, better than me, a lot of home runs. My wife says that we forgot to do one really important thing in the minor leagues, make money. <laughs> but we left there after six years, reconstructed shoulder surgery. I was out of bullets. I was tired. I was like what they used to call a quadruple A player. I was really good in triple A, but I was not going to be good enough to play in the big leagues. So my career ended and off to the races we went. We started a business, we started having kids. Um, my oldest son's here, by the way. Where's Parker at? Oh, there he is. He's hiding in the back row. He's like, he didn't want anybody to know he knew me. Um, we started having kids and started a business and life was great, right? Things were going well. And one of my really good friends from college was a kid named Brandon Hensley that played baseball with me at Georgia Tech. And we show up at coaching our kids. I was coaching Parker's like five-year-old team and he was coaching his son's team, and we didn't know we all lived in the same neighborhood in, or same area in coming. And so we got to see each other, know each other. We went out to dinner, and our wives met, and all that good stuff. And he said at one point, he, he, he did what he was supposed to do. He said, hey, do you guys want to come to church with us one time? And I was just being the nice guy. 
right? I was like, oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, what am I going to tell him, no? Right? I'd be like the worst dude in the world. It's like, oh, absolutely. And so we kind of punt and punt and punt and punt. Finally, we show up at North Point Church. You know, I'm all dressed up. Now, the problem was North Point's got this down to, down to a science, right? You walk by your kids' rooms, and, you know, I got three kids, and, and they're all like clowns over here and balloons over here and throwing cakes against the wall over here. And so the kids are like dying to go into these rooms. And we show up, and I'm sitting there, and it just felt right, right? It just felt like the right time in life for my wife and I to just be sitting there and, and hearing that message. And of course, the kids loved it. So we were hooked. A couple months later, Brandon took the next step and his wife, Tamara. The, the next step was to say, hey, you guys want to join a small group? And I was like, before he even finished it, I was like, already seven excuses out, right? Like, I'm a really busy dude. I own two companies. I've got three kids. I coach every team in the world. I'm the greatest dad in the world. I don't have time for a small group. And he's like, don't worry, I already talked to your wife, Brooke. She said, well, you're in. <laughs> so sure enough, we launched in a small group. And it was just the best environment for us. It was a small group with, with couples. It was just an accountability partner. It was a study. But really, most importantly, what it did was it drove my wife and I closer. We were willing to have those conversations about parenting, about marriage, about all those tough things that are out there. And it just kind of took the edge off of it. And we became hooked, right? Eventually, we would lead small groups. And, and some, at one point, we had two small groups because there was too many people in one small group, so we started two. Um, but all that continued to fast forward, life was going well, and I'm sitting in church one day, and lazy Sunday, whatever, I showed up, probably wearing blue jeans and a t-shirt, hoping Andy or somebody wouldn't see me or call me out. And he had a series called Recovery Road. And it was just a super simple series. It was about, everybody's complaining about the economy and about education and about taxes and about public safety, but nobody's really diving in and doing things themselves, right? So it's just a, just a good old fashioned shin kicking and saying, look, you gotta go get involved. If you want better education and that's your thing, go, go mentor kids that need help. Um, if you wanna improve you know, our fiscal situation, just pay your taxes on time or just continue to walk down the list. And at the end he said, and you might even have to go run for office. So I walked out in the parking lot, and I look at my wife, and I said, hey, uh, let's go run for office. At which point she's like, I did not hear that in that message. <laughs> but we took the leap, and we ran for office, and it just was another opportunity for, for me to kind of see God's hand at, in play. And, and I've learned a lot of things about being in elected office. I was a state rep for five years. I wrote a number of bills. I met some incredible individuals that weren't, weren't really politicos. I wasn't in the Cool Kids Club. I voted no way too often. Right, every time there was a tax increase or something, I didn't tell everybody back home I was gonna do. I just voted no. I didn't like call people names, I just voted no. And then I took this leap of faith when I realized that the job of lieutenant governor was gonna be an open seat. And in Georgia, the job of lieutenant governor is actually a really important job, right? You're the president of the Senate, you control the entire legislative process. But the thesis I wanted to prove, I mean, I wasn't looking to put my private sector stuff on hold completely and to dive headfirst really into politics, right? Like full-time politics. But the thesis I wanted to prove through this faith journey I was on was there's just a better way to do this. And this isn't thinking about Republicans and Democrats or conservative and liberal. This was just about how you build consensus in a room, right? How you take other people's opinion, how you sit on your own ideas because it might be the right thing to do. Um, and so I test drove the thesis. I ran for office, it was a brutal race. You ever get bored in life, just go run for statewide office. You get to see something bad about yourself every eight minutes on TV. <laughs> but we literally spent 18 months traveling the state campaigning. But you could just see, I mean, all those gaps in your life, your small group leaning into you, watching your kids, picking them up, helping your wife through those tough moments. I mean, it was just an incredible experience to have a small group wrapped around us and to have a, something that we knew was bigger than us. And you know, I wasn't convinced, that this is gonna sound funny, but I wasn't convinced that um, this whole notion of feeling like God's hand was on running for office. I, I was just one of those unfortunate people. He didn't tell me that I was going to win. He just said, go run for office. Like, I felt that notion, right? So I kept thinking, this is probably all about teaching me humility, right? And, and that could have been the lesson that was learned. Uh, and Maybe now I'm learning that now. But the notion was to go in and to build consensus. And that was the most rewarding thing about the four years I served as lieutenant governor, is sitting in a room with people that don't agree with the policies that I agreed with but building consensus, praying with people, knowing each other's names, working across party lines, working across geographic lines, surprising people that you can actually get along in the midst of politics. And so a lot of friends, my friends are mission, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll go overseas and, and they'll do a, a mission trip 
uh, they'll, they'll run organizations like this. I felt like my, this period of time in my life, my mission field was just in politics, to just try to be uh, the best example I could possibly be. And so fast forward to the spot I'm at now, I, I, I really feel like um, the guiding light for me is, is a faith that's tested every day. Right? All of our faiths tested. This isn't easy. Life isn't easy. I mean, if you think it's easy, don't say it out loud because, you know, it's like God, you know, it's like he hears you and he's like, oh, okay, I got you. <laughs> um, but, you know, oftentimes I, I, I get this overwhelming sense, you know, my faith is on fire. Some days it burns me and some days it warms me up and I, I don't know which day is going to happen. Um, but I do think it's, it's this opportunity to just be, you know, I've never been one of those people in politics that, and I'm not calling this out, somebody may do this but different strokes for different folks. But I feel like our actions are more important than our words, right? I just, have, I've always gravitated towards that. I think that's the same in my own home. I can read my kids chapter and verse of what they did wrong or what they did right. But I think if I'm not living that out as an example, then it, it just, it's gonna fall on deaf ears. The same is in my community with my neighbor. If they don't vote the same way I do, they don't love the same way I do, they don't, you know, whatever the same way I do, but I'm not willing to talk to them, I've lost the ability to influence their lives in a positive way. And I've also, they, I'm not listening to them positively influence my life. And the same thing with politics. I, I feel like that, that is the Democrat, Republican, Independent, whatever somebody is, we've lost the ability to build consensus. And I think that's, that's an important part. And, and I feel like my best pathway there is, is through my faith. Um, and so, as I said, that, you know, I have the most average Jesus coming to Jesus story out there. I mean, yeah, there's some baseball and business and politics and all that, but just watching this get worked through my veins, watching you know, God show up in so many different ways, um, and watching the, the sense of community is so important for me because it, it, I'm probably a lot like everybody here. I'm kind of resistant to it at times. I mean, there's some probably uh, extroverts in here that just love to show up in large crowds, but... It's not really my thing, right? It's like I would rather just kind of sit on the couch and watch the Braves game and, you know, drink a beer, which, by the way, this is a great place to hold a Bible study or whatever, or a small group setting. Right. Um, and, you know, I would rather do it. So the, so the notion of small group, I've got, to, I've, got to, I've got to be my own catalyst to get up. And, and, and once you get into those groups, once you get into those, once you get a text from somebody that says, hey, I'm praying for you, or, hey, you know, you need some help. Um, it's just, you, you see God's hand all over it. So my encouragement here in, in, uh, is just continue to look for, for groups to engage with, to be a part of, to lean into. I mean, I think that's, that's part of the faith element to me too is, you know, I, I, I'm a visual learner, so I have to learn my own lessons visually. So a lot of times when I think about, God, I don't really want to do this, I physically think about myself leaning out over my toes like further than I can balance myself. Right? And am I willing to do that? Am I willing to lean this further and further and further and, and grow my faith in a way that, that is genuine and wholesome? Um, and to me, that small group, that, you know, hey, well, let's all go grab breakfast at 6.30 in the morning because I know nobody wants to wake up at 5.30 in the morning and get showered and be ready for a meeting at 8 o'clock at the office. But when you, you, you never leave those breakfasts disappointed, right? You, you never feel like you've, you've made a mistake with your time. It's like, you know, tithing to the church. Like, you never put 200 bucks in the offering plate and felt like you got ripped off, right? You, you, you feel genuinely good about it. You don't want your money back, right? It's the same thing with investing in your kids, right? Like, you never, you never get to the finish line and heard somebody say, God, I wish I would have spent less time with my kids. That was just a terrible mistake on my behalf, right? Like, we know the things we need to do, and our faith is what helps drive us and, 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 and focus us in, in those directions. So... Um, anyways, that, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. I have no idea what God's future is. I mean, some days I wake up and I'm like, God, I want no part of politics. Um, and then other days it's like, I feel like that's, that's my God-given lane to be in right now. I'm kind of in purgatory. I decided not to run for office again because I just felt like there was a bigger opportunity for me to, to kind of do the things, heal and rebuild and build consensus across the country. And I'm trying to work on that. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a constant... It's, 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 a, it's a moving target, to say the least. So um, that's my story. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, absolutely. Come on, Alex. And, and before I forget, if, if, I think this is questions and answers. I brought a copy of my book. I'd say my latest book, but it's my only book. Um, whoever asked the best question, 
I'm going to give you a free copy of this book, and I get to determine the best question. Q&A later, so we'll, we'll pause on that. We're going to do Q&A because we've got some questions. We actually, you answered like four of my questions I was going to ask you. <laughs> Sorry. Up there. You're good. Um, so there we go. Um, we're so thankful you're here. This is an awesome chance to dialogue and really talk about some amazing things. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things I wanted to tell you guys on the front end is, you know, we've had political speakers come and speak in the past, the Purpose on Tap. And I think the most important piece of this, and even when we get into Q&A, when we start asking questions, let's keep the Q&A and the conversation flowing on just a faith perspective only. Let's keep politics out of it. That's why we're here. We're here to learn more about how the Lord has moved in Jeff's life. Um, so I, that, that would be what I would ask of you guys tonight. Um, which I think is totally fair. So, you told a cool baseball story. Check. I, gave, I've got much better baseball. Oh, we'll hit it. Let's go. We got some baseball fans in here. All right, it's a good one. All right. I, um, let's see. I've got two that are really, really good. All right. I'm gonna give. I'm gonna give uh, the uh, Wendy's million dollar bet story. All right. So I'm in. I'm in a ball, and I'm doing terrible. I'm like a month into the season, and I don't think I've had an outing where I haven't given up a run. And I was like a bullpen guy, so that, that's not. That's not good. And. Um, out about 100 feet past the right center field fence in Kane County, Illinois, in the middle of nowhere, there's a, on, on a scissor lift, 20, 30 feet in the air, there's a Wendy's million dollar mitt that had been there 20 years. <laughs> and if a player hit it, they won a million dollars. And nobody's ever hit it. Like, never. Never even in batting practice, nobody's ever even, like, airmailed it. So I'm pitching, and of course the bases are loaded. <laughs> And I throw a pitch, and my wife is there, my mom's there, my dad's there. They all flew up for the, for the, for the game. That, it was a Saturday. But like, I can remember this very vividly. And I throw this pitch, and this guy hits it so hard. Right? Like, and when you've done it long enough, and it's a wooden bat, like, you know that sound. Right? Like, I knew this was going to end up on the interstate. And I don't even turn around. Right? It's, a home, it's my home party. I'm like, oh, my God. Like, I'm already like, trying to flag the umpire down to get another ball. And all of a sudden, my home crowd starts cheering and screaming like crazy. And I'm like, oh my God, somebody caught the ball. Maybe it hit a pigeon or something. And I turn around, and that daggone ball is dr dripping out of that glove. He hit the glove. So he starts jogging around the bases, and I'm old, so like, uh, show me the money or whatever. The, well, Jerry Maguire, that movie was going, so he's like, show me the money, show me the money. And I'm like in complete horror. Like, I don't know what the, my emotions are a complete wreck. He scores, and the stadium's buzzing, and everyone's going nuts. And of course, I got to pitch to the next guy. So the next guy hits a ground ball to first base. I run over there and cover the base, and I'm so distraught. I flip the ball over my shoulder, and I start jogging back towards the dugout. And my pitching coach goes, hey, man, that's only two outs. <laughs> I'm like, oh my god. I turn back around. I jog back out of the mound. Somehow I got out of the inning, like just ready to kill somebody. Well, I got my revenge. About two minutes later, in between innings, the PA announcer comes on, and this kid's still thinking he won a million bucks, right? And some fan thought they won a million bucks, too. And the guy comes on, the PA guy, and he goes, ah, I just wanted to let everybody know we read the bylaws, the fine print of the Wendy's Million Dollar Mint Contest, and it looks like it's got to be a home player to hit the glove to win the million bucks. So instead, we're going to get 50 free Frosties to the Michigan Whitecaps. And I was like... I sent some love their way. Yeah, that was, that was humility at its finest. That is awesome. I actually have better ones, but that, I just figured that that's a PG one. Okay. <laughs> Find Jeff after for your PG-13 and R-rated baseball stories. Um, we, you talked a little bit about your early days growing up, your family, where you're from. Tell us a little bit about how you came to know Christ. Um, Feel free to be as specific or not as you'd like. Yeah, it, it was, it, like I said, there was a tale of two stories. There was this, this moment in my family and, and everybody's, you know, there were some people who grown up in a home that there was a, a crash and burn moment. Uh, my parents uh, hit, hit, hit a brick wall. And so my mom found a church. We lived in New Jersey and it really was, it was, I mean, it was one of those, I think the story goes, she was getting her hair cut, she was crying and she was upset. And the girl said, hey, why don't you come to church with me on Sunday? And my mom did. And then she brought me and my sister in then, and we finally talked my dad into it. And before you know it, we're all getting baptized. And it really was a big moment. And then, of course, like we always did, we moved like two, two months later because uh, that was our story. Uh, but it really was a big part of me. I mean, I, I felt God in my heart. I felt like I was on a faith journey. I felt like there was a bigger purpose. But as I said, 
when I went off to go to college, I left with more of my parents' faith than my own faith, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I wasn't praying for myself every day, but they were certainly praying for me. Um, they, they, were, they were planting those seeds uh, of all, all around me. And you know what? Uh, I, I think it was an important journey for me. Had I just kind of carried that through, I don't think my, my faith would have been a, as, as intense. But then when my good friend reached out and brought me into the fold, uh, I re-engaged that, that flame that, that God had started in, inside of me. And, and the neat part was my wife wasn't on that same journey. She didn't have that early faith story. And so we, we got to come back together and really re realize the value of raising kids in, in a home that's driven by faith. I mean, I, you know, so, somebody may hate my politics, love my politics. This isn't about my politics. This is about I genuinely feel guided a majority of my decisions based on my interpretation of my faith. Like, what does God want me to do today? Who does he want me to reach out to? Who does he want me to say I'm sorry to? Who does he want me to think of more importantly than myself? Getting to watch my wife, um, who's not an extrovert at all, she's, I mean, she, the one thing, when I said I was going to run for lieutenant governor, she's like, I'm all in. I'll help you any way I can. You put a microphone in my hand, I'm leaving you. <laughs> she was serious. Um, to watch her get nervous on a beach trip because she had decided to get baptized and she had to give her testimony uh, before the baptism and to see that actually play out in front of me was just absolutely priceless. Mm. Uh, and so, uh, for, for me, having a spouse on that same faith journey has made this possible. If it wasn't, there's been so many leaps of faith along the way of business and baseball and running for office and raising kids in a difficult environment and being counter cyclical to kind of what's going on and sw swimming upstream politically. Uh, without us being on the same faith page, it would be impossible. That's huge. Um, kind of dovetailing with that, um, you mentioned that you and Brooke lead a couple's Bible study. Um, you know, how many of y'all are married? We got any married guys in the house? We got a lot of married guys here. Give them some advice. What's the best piece of marriage advice you got? Best piece of marriage advice. Uh, always be right. <laughs> just, just dig in. It pays off every time. Says nobody who's <laughs> ever been married. Uh, I, I mean, look, I don't know how everybody's wired. I'm wired that, like, when it gets super intense as a guy, you know, and you're worried about figuring out, you know, how to invest or how to buy the next house or how to deal with that gap or how to take that job or how to deal with whatever the issue of the day is that's kind of supposed to be on the guy's plate. What I've had to realize is it's better when I kind of share that with my wife, kind of take her on the journey with me. Uh, and the way I learned that was through a good friend of mine who's extremely wealthy. I mean, this guy's, like, off the charts. And if I told you his name, you know who he was. And he came to me, and it was interesting. He goes to the same church, and he, and he said, my wife and I got into kind of a rip-roaring fight about how much money I give away. And I was like, that sounds strange. Like, you know, like, how does that happen? Like, she should be, like, over the top. And he goes, because I never include her in it. He goes, every time we go somewhere, um, somebody thanks me for this huge contri contribution or for the new wing of the building that we built. And he goes, I never included her, not because I was like trying to isolate her, just because I didn't think she cared. Mm. But she didn't get to feel the gift of giving mm. also. And mm. so that was like a big eye opener. And of course, I'm not like tithing, you know, stuff with two commas in it. But I think from living life with your spouse um, so that stuff doesn't sneak up on them, right? Like tension with your kids or tension with your job or tension with finances or tension with just them in general. I think trying to be as transparent as you can uh, is probably the best place. At least I've learned that to be the best lesson for me. And, and by the way, I've not mastered that, right? Like even this morning, I had this long-winded conversation about, well, why, why is this the first time I'm hearing about this? Well, it's the first, you know, I didn't think about it. I'm not perfect at it, but I would give that as encouragement to everybody. That's great. So, and, and, and to that point, a couple small group really helps you do that, hmm. right? Because it makes you a little more vulnerable. Like some of the most vulnerable times in my life uh, are when we get in the car after leading a small group, talking about whatever the book of the Bible that we're talking about, like, you know, the gospel just lit us on fire about something, and we get in the car, and we're able to have a conversation that we probably wouldn't have had driving to small group, but it just seems like it's melted us a little enough to where we're able to have that conversation, just whether it be, like I said, about kids and finances or careers or decisions or whatever the story is, or running for lieutenant governor. I waited for after a really good small group, and then I told her I had a great idea. <laughs> I love that. So when you, Tim talked about your bio earlier, I mean, 
you know, tech grad, tech base. I didn't graduate player. from Georgia Tech, just for the record. Hey, I always cool. clear that up. I got drafted my junior year, and I left. I tried to go back like 10 times. Now my son's a, a freshman at Georgia Tech, and so he's going to graduate before I do. Uh, but I, I never graduated. My wife did. Tech baseball player. Tech baseball player. Tech baseball player. <laughs> played for the Marlins. Sold a company, CEO of a company, lieutenant governor of the state of Georgia. You've achieved a lot of influence and responsibility in your life. And my question to you is, you know, without getting into politics too much, how do you keep in practice of faith when you have other influential people around you who do not pay, play by the same rules? Yeah, um, like, I, like I started with, I think my, my faith is more about what I do than, than what I say. And so being, being the best positive influence I can be uh, in, as, as a believer, when, you, when you're, you know, let's just use the office environment, you're in the office and you're really trying to you know, talk folks into joining you for a small group or you're just trying to be a positive influence. Somebody went through a tough divorce somebody lost their job, whatever you're trying to influence them with, you're only one stupid argument away from lighting all of that credibility on fire, right? Like you're only one petty little argument or, or, or petty little position or, or stupid mistake away from, you know, losing all that credibility. And that, that feels like a healthy weight on my shoulders, yeah. right? And so the last thing I want to do is have my three kids look at dad as a fraud. Right, like that, that's really been dr driven a lot of my politics the last few years. Has been like the last thing I want to do is have my kids turn on the TV and go, you know, he does all this Jesus stuff at home and he's always telling us to do the right thing, but here he is, he, he's, he's just doing this to be in the cool kids club. That, just, that scares me to death to think I would lose my influence with my kids to do that. Um, that, that that's the motivating factor. The other part to this is. And, and I give speeches across the country at times on intellectual honesty, whether it be in political environments or corporate environments, walk into a boardroom and talk about intellectual honesty. I think my faith helps keep me accountable to that. Right? If you're being intellectually honest, you're asking yourself all those questions that you don't really want to ask yourself. Like, hey, am I spending too much time on the road when I don't need to be on the road? Am I, you know, am I spending money on things I shouldn't be? Am I really taking the right attitude? Am I really talking about all the things I should do? Am I working hard enough at work? Like intellectual honesty, I think is a faith, it's easier with a faith drive behind it. Mm -hmm. And I think ultimately that, that's what get, gets us better. I think laying that over politics broadly, that's what we're not doing in politics is being intellectually honest with each other. We're having siloed arguments, D's and R's and independence and all this other stuff, but we're not being intellectually honest. Like, hey, the other side, that's actually a really good idea. I know I'm not supposed to say that because I'm on the other, I'm shirts and their skins, but that really does make sense, and how do I incorporate that into to what I'm trying to do overall? That's great. Um, my next question is, you know, so today's 9-11, you know, 23 years ago today, um, you know, horrible, tra you know, tragedy in our country. And I think the thing that everybody can maybe agree on with, with this is that that tragedy seemed to sort of unite our country in a way that hasn't happened in so long. And so, you know, really without diving too much into the political space here, like how do, we, how do we all as individuals begin to sort of change ourselves to begin to mend that divide? Yeah, it is hard to believe 23 years ago, my wife was pregnant with Parker um, when that happened. And I remember exactly where I was sitting. I, we had just started a brand new company. I just finished my baseball career. And I was sitting in a customer's office trying to sell them like 12 polo shirts for like, you know, make $8 profit or something. Um, and he had a TV on behind him at his desk, and it was Imus in the morning. And I'm trying to like concentrate, but I could see smoke coming out of the, the towers. And about right then, I saw the second plane hit, and I was like, "Time out! I gotta go." And it was just this this moment in time, and, and I'll never forget how I felt for the next umpteen weeks, right? Like how patriotic. There was no D's and R's. There was we were we were Americans. Yeah. We were driven by a higher calling than just political you know shouting matches right and that made a huge part in, in a huge impact on my mind when i eventually 10 years later would run for office right like, like i wanted that that patriotic moment and, and there's some unicorns and rainbows to that right like that's just a natural inclination to kind of gravitate towards each other in a moment of crisis but that was a special moment in time that our country really was at its best when we were at our worst when we were the scaredest we were we were the strongest and to me, that's an important part. Going back to how do we fix the whole problem, this, this, isn't, this isn't super complicated. 
we fix the problem by going back to loving your neighbor. Right? That sounds warm and fuzzy, but like we're called to love our neighbor. That really kind of fixes everything, right? I mean, like, if you believe in the paperwork in the Bible, then that's what it says, right? And, and, and think about what that means. Andy Stanley always says, what does love require of me? Well, love requires me to go talk to that neighbor, even if they got an opposing yard sign in their yard this November. Loving my neighbor means I walk over there, even if they're not married to the same sexual orientation I am. Loving my neighbor means going to somebody, even if they you know, don't like something on the HOA vote. Wh whatever the issue of the day is, that's loving your neighbor. Not because it's politically expedient, not because it's good for your career, because it's good for your heart. It's good for the country. And so, you know, th there's two ways to, to come back to that type of feeling. I don't want a tragedy. I don't want another 9-11. I don't ever want to turn on the TV and see another 9-11. I don't want to see any of these shootings, any of these tragedies play out. I don't want to see economic collapses. None of it. N none of us do. But that's certainly one way to get our nation's attention and to change the, this, what seems to be an unsustainable trajectory in, in, in political, and in, in, it has now leaked out into communities. But the other way is for us, we the people, to make the change ourselves, to start changing that trajectory, to, to start looking at what are the three or four things I can do to be a better Christian, if that's your deal, right? If you're not, and your buddy just baited you into free beer, and you're like, I don't know this Jesus guy, but this, this beer is great, it's free. That's great, but if you're one of those that are like, like me, that's like, hey, what can I do better? Just go figure out how to love your neighbor, right? Like that's probably the most important thing you're gonna do this year is go figure out how to go find that person in the neighborhood or, or in, your, in your office that you are, do have a divide, a noticeable, meaningful divide, and go say, hey, let me go buy you a steak. Like that might be the most important thing you do all year. That's great, I love it. Um, I, I feel like I, I feel like a lot of things you said resonate with me personally. Um, but this is the last question, and then we'll open it up to Q and A. Um, then freestyle. That's yeah. There you go. Um, so this is the last thing we're going to ask him, Jeff. I would like for you to, if you could summarize one thing. These guys are driving home, calling their wives, their girlfriends. Purpose on tap, Jeff Duncan. What is the one thing you want them to remember you say? The one thing, I would say wake up every day and be as honest with yourself as you can possibly be. Right? Be honest with yourself and whatever is going on in your life, whatever you're doing well, whatever you're not doing well. And really the only way to be honest with yourself, because look, we're all born, you know, we, 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 we do a really, really good job of lying to ourselves, right? Like fibbing ourselves, tricking ourselves. Like we're, we're better at convincing ourselves of bad ideas and lies of anybody, right? It's just, just wake up and try to be as honest with yourself as you can. Do, do what you know is the right thing to do. And, and I, I gave a big speech a couple months ago, or a couple weeks ago, feels like months ago. And I pointed to this coaster story. Um, that uh, it, was, it was Parker's brother was at a, going from elementary school uh, to middle school at Browns Bridge and the, the small group leader said, hey, he hands us, it's like the scariest moment in my life. Like he hands us a wooden coaster that's blank and a Sharpie and he goes, write your kid an encouraging message, something that's gonna inspire him. And I'm like, like you could have given me like a week to come up with this, right? And all of us, that, so whatever, something came into my mind. I said, doing the right thing will never be the wrong thing. And that has just kind of grown into being our family motto, is doing the right thing will never be the wrong thing. And so I think all of us wake up and know the right thing to do. Maybe not the popular thing to do. That was scary. Not the pop, cut them off. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> second row, second. <laughs> uh, we all know the right thing to do. Just wake up and, in, 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 in inspire yourself to look for that right thing to do. Are we gonna bat a thousand? No. Are we gonna lose our temper seven times before we eat lunch? Yes. But try to make it six the next day, right? That, that's just, I think honesty is the best place to land. Jeff, thank you so much. Appreciate Absolutely. it. Doug and Jeff, round of applause. Do we have any questions? Obviously, we'll start right here in the front. Just stand up, just stand up. Uh, first off, I want to you know, thank you for you know, going with your faith and your beliefs. Uh, you know, trying to stay out of the politics, but you know, walking away from the politics uh, to, for your faith uh, and your beliefs. 
what advice would you have? There's a lot of young people here tonight. What advice would you have for them to live up to their faith uh, while they're dealing with all the worldly distractions uh, at work or like you're in the neighborhood and stuff? You, you probably started a little bit of what you want people to remember from the night. But how would you, you know, help people in their work environments today uh, to be able to really you know, live with their faith? Yeah, great question. So, I, and I've had to learn this, right? Like, uh, this isn't like I would. He asked, uh, what, what would you recommend for somebody that has to compete with, like, life and faith? Like, what are some things that you could do or would do to kind of keep those, to keep those reinforced? Is that a good recap of what you asked? So, this is not, you know, instinctual. This was had to be a learned trait. But it, you got to play offense instead of defense with your faith, right? Like, you can't wait for it all hit the skids to be riddled with anxiety, down your last dollar, and your wife hates you and your dog ran away, right? Like, that's... I mean, I guess you can go jump on your knees and open up your Bible, but my, my recommendation is go figure out how to play offense instead of defense. Right? Like going back to this thing, you'll never regret setting your alarm 30 or 40 minutes early every day. Yeah, maybe you're a gym rat and that's a good deal, but for me, I'm okay to get up early. Like set your alarm 30 or 40 minutes early and go downstairs and be intentional seven and a half days a week to like read a Bible, get a devotional book, just be accountable to yourself. Play offense on your day instead of playing defense on your day, right? Because it all is gonna fall apart at some point, right? Uh, and you want to just be prepared. For me, my simple routine is once a year I go to the Bible store, Bible bookstore, I walk in, I try to find like what looks like the most entertaining devotional book that I can get. I don't know who these authors are. You know, they're probably some senior pastor that makes a million bucks or something. Who knows? Right? <laughs> it's got great pictures, right? I'd love to give you a better reason than that. But whatever, it's a devotional book that talks about Jesus. I'm going to get something out of it. And then because I'm stupid and didn't graduate from Georgia Tech, I, I read the Message Bible. Right? Like it just, I get it. Right? I can read, I can read the King James Version and be like, is this Latin? Right? But I, I read the Message Version and I literally pick a different book of the Bible and I read a chapter or two, whatever I can stomach for the day. And I got a little highlighter in my hand and I've just, that's my thing. Right? Yours may be different. Audiobooks. Uh, you might like the King James Version. Who knows? But just find a routine that allows you to play offense on your faith instead of defense. Right? That just helped me. And, you know, politics is like life on steroids. Right? I mean, nothing beats uh, going to work, giving a speech in front of, you know, 500 people at the Capitol, and then going to a TV studio and giving an interview in front of 8 million people, and then coming home and your wife says that they only got two death threats today. Right? Like, like that's life at, in, on steroids. If I wasn't playing offense on that, if I wasn't out in front of that, that would all rattle me so much that I wouldn't be prepared and I wouldn't be able to, to I'd hopefully be authentic. Mm. Mm. Right here. This guy's got a Georgia Tech shirt. Don't keep him hanging too long. <laughs> Go ahead. So, in the public realm, the premium of privacy versus the vulnerability you talk about your faith today, how do you mesh that without having two different characters of public person versus private person when you are in the dead of the press in the speech? Yeah. Hopefully you don't think this is a political answer, but I, I really genuinely think I'm the same person in public as I am in private, right? Like, my kids would probably be a better testament to this or, or close friends or whatnot, but I try to be the same person in both places. I try, like if I'm sitting at the Capitol and you guys, are at, reporters are asking these same questions, and I think that's really been one of the, one of the draws. I mean, I, I have a contract with CNN now, so I go on TV multiple, I was on earlier today, I was wearing the same outfit except I put on a button up shirt untucked and a tie and a jacket. I look like a hillbilly. Right? But y'all didn't know I was wearing flip-flops. But I think that's one of the appeals is, is this just matter of fact, like plain, simple answer. So I think trying, and I think that's like, whether you're in politics or whatnot, uh, we probably all fall into the trap of being one person at work. Like maybe we're really buttoned up and polished and professional and well-prepared and then we come home and you know, we're a train wreck. Or maybe it's the other way around. Uh, I think being the, being the same person is, is, I believe, an element of our faith, right? Not, not being you know, a tale of two stories. Um, and, and for me, the family thing is just like ultra important. Um, you know, one of the biggest knocks on me in public office was that uh, he doesn't do enough political events. He's always at his kids' games, right? He's always, you know, going to have donuts with dad or, you know, whatever, or, or doing small groups, right? I missed a lot of really important political things because I was leading small group that night. Like, I wasn't going to let down six couples because I had to go eat some dead rubber chicken and give four minutes of praise to somebody I'd never met before. 
Right? Like, I mean, that might have got me two votes, but I just got to speak, you know, to, to a whole group. So I think I, I would literally walk into my staff's office and hand them my kid's baseball schedule, football schedule, golf schedule, my small group schedule, and say, all right, tell me what, you know, plan around this. You know, imagine handing that to like a 25-year-old rocket scientist that graduated from some political science major place, and they're like, this is so counterintuitive. Like, why would you ever think about going to your kid's game? Because he's pitching. Mm -hmm. That's great. Anybody else? We're here in the front. Yeah, yeah, Parker, uh, back check. He gave, he gave a thumbs up. Thumbs up. Wow. One thumb. <laughs> he went to Georgia, so just hold this. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. The, the most annoying part is that not only do I go to the kids' games, but I'm addicted to coaching. Like, I'm one of the, like, I love coaching. It's funny, I coach all these, all of my kids' baseball teams, football teams. The greatest job I've ever had is being an offensive coordinator on a youth football team. We had like 200 plays, I signed signals in, we had headsets, it was just awesome. <laughs> Adam, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much, Jeff, for coming. Um, as a new dad, I've got a two-year-old son and one on the way. Um, I'm just going to go... Don't, don't be afraid to space that out a little bit. Yeah, I know. Father's going to tell right? Uh, but what advice do you have for someone who's, you know, you didn't, you didn't really talk about your private sector too much, besides you just did a lot of it, It's complicated, uh, yeah, absolutely, and we've all had those moments in time like where you're just a project that it's just, you're never gonna explain it to your spouse, like, you know, th like this is really gonna soak the life out of me for six weeks and whatnot. I think being transparent with it, like being playing offense on it, like, hey, this is a really difficult period of time, but also being a realist, right? Like a lot of this stuff, we put undue pressure on ourselves. Going back to the political stuff, if I had one, I had a thousand staffers tell me, like this, I, I get it, you wanna go to your kids' games or you wanna teach small group or lead small group, this is like the most important political thing you can do. And I took the bait sometimes and I'd go do it. And then I'd be like, that was kind of a dud, right? Like, or, or I can work around it. Or maybe I can go to the first half and just request that I speak at the first half and then leave, what, whatever, problem solved. I think, I think doing that and just being honest with yourselves. But, but, but sometimes too, there's, you're young, you went to Georgia Tech, so you got the world's your oyster, right? You can get any job you want. You're just really smart. Anything else you want me to say? <laughs> but but, 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 but my, my point to that is, Sometimes it's not the right career, right? If you'd have told me, I mean, I've had 12 careers since I left Georgia Tech, right? I thought I was gonna be a Major League Baseball player and end up in the Hall of Fame and you know, have $100 bills falling out of my ears. That didn't happen, none of that. But uh, you know, more and more careers, so you know, maybe there's intentionality. The way my wife and I problem solved was, and this is kind of a crazy story, but we started our first business out of our living room, 9-11 happened, she's pregnant with our first child, like, it's like failure was not an option. I took out a $25,000 home equity line as my backstop. Like that was my banker, was a home equity line. And she goes to, she works up until the day she delivers Parker. And I was like, don't worry, I hired somebody to take her place. Six weeks after this girl wasn't working out. So I had to come home and be like, hey, I, I had to fire Tina. I need you to be at work like tomorrow. And I've set up one of the offices as a nursery. And it ended up being like the greatest two years of our life. Right, like just figuring out a way to work through it. Yeah. Is it really the days, I mean, this is something I've thought about, is you talk about intentionality and choice. Is it really more the days that you choose to be intentional, where, like, if you did choose to be intentional that day, that day is just took, took you, took a coach? No, because I think everybody around you realizes what you're, what you're trying to go towards, right? I think that, that, that's the, if it just becomes a, a habit, uh, then everybody around you is going to kind of feel the void. Just like, you know, flip, flip the script. Your, your, your manager or your, your employees, if you're managing a group, they're gonna feel the vacuum. They're gonna feel the lack of attention to detail. So you just gotta find that perfect balance. And quite honestly, faith has been the, the area to find it. I mean, 
you know, the secret gravitational pull for me for faith is just peace, right? I just feel more peaceful when my faith is, is, is kind of humming along, when I'm, when I'm in the Word, when I'm you know, in a small group, when my wife and I are talking about the tough issues through looking through our faith lens. I just feel a peace that makes sense. I can't explain it. I certainly try to replicate it every day, and I can't. Um, and, to, and to me, that, that's kind of that journey. We got time for one or two more, boys? These are usually the hard ones. Tim, we got time for one more? One or two more? Okay, we'll keep it ripping. Let's go on the, let's, 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 we got a tech jersey. We got to get and, a tech And a number five Nomar Garcia Parra jersey. Do you, you know, do you know how Nomar got the name Nomar? I <laughs> This is going to, this, this is going to blow your, blow your mind. His dad's name is Ramon. So they spelled his dad's name backwards. <laughs> no kidding. I know his, I've met his dad. Wow. He probably doesn't remember that, but I do. <laughs> great, great, great story here. Oof. Uh, how did I meet my wife and how did I decide to marry her? The second one could get me in trouble. Yeah. Parker, Parker, I told you to come here and be respectful. <laughs> oh, it's Jack Miller. <laughs> Uh, all right, so this is a great story how I met my wife. So I told you we moved every two years because my dad was a pseudo hitman, and uh, we end up in Georgia. And I wanted I was here. Here I am, going to be a senior in high school, and I was a quarterback in Naperville, Illinois, at the high school I went to there. And so I'm trying to come down and win the job as a senior as, as a senior to be the quarterback. And so the kid that I beat out was not very good. Um, so I like beat him out like in ten minutes. Well, the next day I throw a pass and I and I hit one of the offensive linemen's helmets with my thumbnail, right? It wasn't like this gory in injury, but I like broke my thumbnail off. And they're like, go see the trainer. So I jog over to the trainer and she like almost passes out. And I'm like, what's the story? You're a trainer, this is like a little bit of blood. She's like, I'm just doing this for extra credit. Like, I don't like blood. <laughs> Fast forward a couple of years, that's my wife. <laughs> we actually ended up at Waffle House that night. I was like, hey, I'm new to town. I'm on the DL, I can't practice anymore. Where do you want to go? So we went to Waffle House. I, um, we, we, and she's a year younger. We ended up going to Georgia Tech together. You know why I married her? Because she just made me happy and she made me better, right? Like, um, she was, she, and to this day, she's willing to have that tough conversation with me when nobody else really does. Mm. Uh, and that means a lot. And I know it comes from genuinely from the bottom of her heart. And she's dropped dead gorgeous too, so. Let's do one more and you pick, yeah. The only guy raising his hand. <laughs> You know, I, I live a very public life, so I'm, I'm in front of groups and crowds, and once again, I kind of go back to, you know, I want my faith to speak through my actions and not necessarily my words. Um, and the greatest kind of faith compliment to me is when somebody kind of gets to know you, whether it be a neighbor watching you handle, you know, complex issues or, you know, conflict or whatever, or watch you in the carpool line. Uh, you know, all those times where you have kind of the, the social right to jump off the rails, uh, HOA meetings, wh whatever. And that person comes up to you, and it doesn't happen often, and says, hey, I'm going through some problems, and you just, you, you go about life a little bit differently. Tell me more. Right? Like, that's the greatest compliment to somebody's faith. It doesn't happen all the time. But to the flip side, I think about the people I've alienated. The times, I mean, I'm sure I got mad at somebody this week, right, that was just stupid, that maybe was watching me, and they're like, this guy's something special, right? Like, he, he genuinely cares about people that he doesn't have to care about. He's listening to people's opinions. He's planting seeds. He's investing in other people's, other kids. And I'm sure I popped off or did something stupid or mad I didn't get the right change back. And then that person's watching is like, eh, he's a fraud. That hurts. So I think it's just, you know, you just never know when God's going to show up. I always think about the story. I, 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 do, I go back and forth to New York a lot um, because of the CNN stuff and, and some private equity stuff. And there's that... And once again, I don't even remember the, the chapter and verse, but there's a, there's a story in the gospel where it talks about, you know, this guy shows up and, and you know, Jesus is like, um, 
you know, you, you weren't there to help me when I needed you the most. He's like, I never saw you. And he's like, no, I was there. I was that homeless person that you passed up. I was that, you know, person that needed prayer. I was that person that just needed a hug. I, I, I think about that when I walk up and down the streets and I see somebody, or if I'm walking in politics and I see somebody, even if they're screaming at me, calling me names, you know, whatever. I haven't figured out how to minister to the people that give me death threats, but uh, I'm, I'm get, just, I'll, I'll get there. Maybe that's my PhD in faith. But uh, yeah, I just, once again, I just cannot stress enough. It's our actions. And we know that, right? Like we know that. It's it, just because the, the people that impact us the most in our lives are the people that are like, golly, man, that, just, I can't believe they were able to handle that the right way. So. Who gave the best question out to you? You got a book to give out, don't you? Got to give it to number five, Nomar Garcia Parra. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, man. Thanks, guys. Um, one more time for Jeff. Yeah, just put it in, yeah, put it in the glass. Now we're good. Thank you. Um, that was awesome. I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, thank you for coming to Purpose on Tap. The reason we do this, our mission is to help men find Christ-centered community. That's what we are all about. We want everybody to meet. That's why in the beginning we said, meet your neighbor. That is the whole reason we gather and do this quarterly. We have a meeting on December 4th. Um, we have a great speaker coming to speak on December 4th. We're not going to announce it quite yet. We'll announce it once we get closer, but we are super pumped. I'm not going to give any teasers. Maybe you can come find me later and talk about it. I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. Uh, but Calder is very excited. Um, so last thing before we get out of here. Um, we know in our mission, like I said, to help you guys find Christ-centered community. How does that happen? Every single Friday morning at 7 a.m., there's a Bible study that meets here at Sweetwater. Uh, who comes to that Bible study? Anybody in the room? So there's a lot of guys in the room to go. I personally go. We meet from 7 to 8, and we have a bunch of men's small groups that meet. If you are interested in coming, I want you to pull out your phone, and I want you to text me. Okay, I'm going to give my number out, and I will connect you guys. If y'all are interested at all, my number is 678-543-4152. 678-543-4152. Shoot me a text. So that's all we got. Thank you all for coming. Y'all hang around a little bit. we got to get out here by 9.30.